Um, and I have to say, I think it's kind of uh, funny timing that I get to talk right after Aaron, who's got you all in the like feeling space. <laughs> and now we're going to go 180, <laughs> and we're going to get right back into your heads. Engineers don't <laughs> <have> feelings. <laughs> sort of true, almost true. <laughs> I almost think like if we could be like an anti like a matter antimatter if Aaron and I got together. There's probably no pictures of us together because it would just be space. <laughs> um, so anyhow, I'm going to get everyone to stand up for a minute. And what I'd like to have everyone do is those of you that are sort of like the two or three seats closest to the middle aisle, I just want you to do like two or three squats right now. Those of you that aren't squatting, watch the people that are squatting. Not with judgment, I'm totally on with Aaron on that. Just watch, just think, what are you seeing? No judgment, just what are you seeing? Just two or three of them. And then you guys can stop, and now the ones closest to the outside, if you were just watching, now you're gonna squat a few times. And then if you were just squatting, take a look. Like, don't just look at one person, look at a few people. Do they all look the same? Are they bending from the same place? Back to the ones in the middle now. A few squats for you. And same thing, start watching. Look at different people, does everyone look the same? Do people have different angles? Do they have different stances, back to the outside people again. Okay, and now back to the inside, but this time instead of doing squats, I want a hip hinge or a deadlift. And if you're not sure what that is, basically that means you're going to bend at the hips. I'm not going to tell you anything else. You guys are going to interpret what that is. Do a few of them. Others watch. What do you see? Now other side. Outside people. Now I want you to all do a few. A few hip hinges, like three or three or so. If you aren't doing it, watch it. Watch more than one person. See what you see. Back to the middle people. Just like three or four hip hinges. If you're not doing it, watching. If you're watching, you're not doing it. Okay, now back to the outside people again. Okay, good. And now you can all sit down again. So we didn't quite go brain a bit, but it was a little bit more analytical. And... Uh, this is kind of what my talk is about. I'm assuming that not everybody looked exactly the same when they squatted or hip pinched. I think that's a pretty fair assumption. Um, now I know how this works. <laughs> this is a conversation that I had with a coach uh, last week, actually. And it was, it was interesting, because as he was saying this, and I, you know, I, by the way, we're talking about squatting. Just, <laughs> 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 just in case everyone's wondering. Um, <laughs> So this is, I mean, I, there's, there's some truth to this, right? Like a good coach can, can coach a squat. A good co coach can get someone, can probably take anyone and get them into a good squat. And it's arguably a sign of a good coach. But as he was saying this, this is what I was thinking. Uh, there's a big difference between everyone can squat and everybody should squat. And, and, then, and it was interesting, as I was saying this to him, he kind of, it came out, he's like, well, actually, my hips are kind of wrecked. And I was like, hmm, you know, and... Uh, I understand that feeling. So these are actually my hips. Uh, and I used to squat a lot. I used to squat quite heavy. And I, my hips were in pain all the time. It's like 20 years of, they were always in pain. I played sports. And, but it wasn't like, I didn't feel bad. It's a weird thing. And anyone who's an athlete who's been through this, you sort of get like, it's not that I was like, oh, this sucks. My hip hurts. It was just like, you know, my hip hurts. Like the sky is blue. The grass is green. It's just a thing, right? So you don't really get it. And then uh, one day, it was, I was filling out prescriptions for uh, birth control and Celebrex at the same time. And I was like, <laughs> that doesn't feel right. <laughs> so that's when I started to realize, like, this is, there's something a little off here, and I probably should actually investigate. I'd been, you know, years of saying to my GP or my family doctor, like, this is, there's something off. And it was like, oh, you're probably just doing too much, or it's just a groin strain, or whatever. So, but after that, I was like, you know, I'm going to actually investigate. I went to a proper sports medicine doc. And it turns out I had femoral acetabular impingement. So I went through a process, I ended up having surgery, uh, and now I get to do all these sports. Like, I don't take drugs, I get to do all sorts of sports. Uh, there's some things I still don't do. Uh, but it was, for me, the first introduction to this, like, huh, like, maybe we're not all the same. And if we're not all the same, maybe we shouldn't all do the same stuff. So that was that sort of first light bulb for me. Um, and so this is, <laughs> this is one of my uh, TV, uh, things that I like to watch. So I'm not really into reality TV much, but I love the voice. But you notice, right, the four judges, if you actually look at their faces, they don't look the same, right? There's that, and it's not just that they do their hair differently. Like, structurally, they're different. Although I find it interesting that Adam and Blake are actually have similar structures. Uh, Pharrell and Christina as well. But it's pretty clear, right? <laughs> I don't think that's a judgment, but let's face it, right, that like, there are some similarities across that way. Um, 
But it's obvious, like, okay, so from here up, our bones are different. So why would we assume that from here down, our bones are the same? Right? Like, it just doesn't make any sense. And for me, engineer mind, it's particularly, like, illogical. Uh, and in fact, so speaking of my background, this is actually what I used to do. Uh, I was an electronic warfare engineer, which is, I, even just saying that still seems weird to me, because I'm, I'm a tree hugger to a certain extent. Uh, so I used to work, uh, let's see if the, that section there, that's where the radars were. So I was responsible for uh, calculating whether, whether the missiles were going on target or off target and things like that. And I actually quit my, that job very shortly after I was in my boss's office and she was really excited because the helicopter that she used to work on had shot down a bunch of people somewhere else in the world in a conflict. And I was like, uh, huh. To me, that would be mortifying, obviously. So that was when I knew I couldn't stay in that industry. So I went and I started hugging trees. <laughs> or more accurately, I worked in climate change. Uh, and that was cool, but it still wasn't really, didn't really encapsulate me. Like when I, uh, I always knew that I actually wanted to write stuff and I wanted to speak, but I never had a topic I wanted to talk about. So when I got into personal training, it actually made sense being like, this is what I do in my spare time. You know, I play ultimate, I play tennis, I ski. I do anything to be physical. So what Aaron was talking about, about uh, wanting performance, that's been my whole life of activity. I, I want to perform, I love it. So personal training became a very obvious choice, eventually. Uh, it just took me like 15 years to find it. Um, but just because I became a trainer didn't mean that I stopped being an engineer, as it turns out. You know, I'm fairly inquisitive. And I remember I used to always watch there's some guys, you watch them do push-ups, and like, they could probably do like 100 of them, and they just go and go and go. But I'm watching these people, and like, they're not actually moving very far. And it's not that they're doing partial form. Like, there are some people that do crappy push-ups, but some of the people are actually doing full-range push-ups, but I'm like, they're going like this far, because they have short arms and they have a big chest. So suddenly, that's where I like, you know, I'm an engineer, that's where I start to go. And then my friend Yvonne, who's the one on the far, I guess, your left, um, he is amazing at bench press, but I'm watching him doing it, I'm like, well, no wonder. And so instead of just sort of questioning, thinking like, wow, it seems like he doesn't move the bar very far relative to me, I thought, hey, let's start to measure it. Uh, so I got out my FMS stick, and I measured his, mine, and three other guys at the gym. Uh, and it turns out, yeah, there's, there is actually a significant difference in how much work someone has to do when they deadlift, depending on their limb length. Now, of course, there's also, and Yvonne pointed out, uh, you know, he's got an arch his back, I don't. Uh, he's a power lifter, I'm not. So, yes, that is part of it, but that doesn't explain the, you know, 9 inch to 16 inch difference. So, that was in my first, like, aha moment of, yep, we are different. Which is not to say that I'm not going to bench press, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to really focus on it as a, you know, I should get to a, the same level that someone else does, because, you know, that other person might be doing 78% less work than I am on their bench press, so it's not actually a legitimate comparison. Uh, <laughs> my second lab, um, I like to F, I FMS all of my clients, that's the functional movement screen. Um, and I also, not even a lie, I did actually FMS my cat, this is Otis. <laughs> uh, Otis is 19 actually, uh, so doing well. Um, we do, I joked with this, I play a game sometime called like dead or asleep because <laughs> she's that old and it would be okay. <laughs> Um, so what I learned from the FMS, <laughs> it is awful, but, you know, 19 is like 96 in human years or whatever, so it's okay. Um, what I learned from the FMS on my clients, I didn't really learn a lot from FMSing Otis, was the, <laughs> uh, most women, for, mo for, for most women, the trunk stability push-up is the hardest, tough, hardest test, significantly so, and for men, that's only 16% of men struggle with that, so that's a big difference. Uh, and then conversely, men tend to struggle with a straight leg raise, more than half of them. Women is about 28%, but the interesting thing there, I do a passive straight leg raise test as well. So for those of you who aren't familiar, active straight leg is people lie on their back, let both legs straight, they lift one leg up, basically see how far it can go without the other leg turning. Uh, and typically, uh, when men struggle with the straight leg raise test, it's because they actually can't get any further. When I do a passive, like I move it myself, I can't move it any further. When women struggle with this, it's typically a core stability issue, which I know because when I then go to lift it, I can actually move it further than they can. 
So, so, that's, so the real difference is they tend to lack a range of motion. So, and last year I talked about the you know, issues with push-ups for women about strength and muscle mass and stuff, but I, I've kind of done some more digging since then and uncovered some kind of cool stuff about our actual body shapes that affect it. So, uh, for starters, women typically sternum is shorter than for men. Uh, and our ilium, which is like basically the vertical length of our pelvis, is also shorter. And then basically what that means in, in relation, like if you've got a shorter here and shorter here, then relatively speaking, this is longer. And then on top of that, and this is sort of cool, the spinous process, which is the, basically like the pieces of bone that kind of stick out the back of your vertebral column. In women, they're more horizontal than they are in men. And this is by design. This is basically so that our bodies can sag when women get pregnant. Right, so this is a design feature, and it's a great design feature to allow for pregnancy. But if you think back to what Ingrid said the other day about how she sees more often in women than men that sag when they're trying to get core stability, maybe this is why. And so if you actually look at, and I'm an engineer, so of course I'll look at it this way, but if you look at someone doing a plank, their body, basically this part of them is effectively a bridge, right? So when you're thinking about the two bases are smaller, and then you've designed this bridge that's longer, and it's got more sag. And then on top of that, another study has shown that women, our back erector strength is 50% lower than men's. On average, of course, there's differences. So now we add like the guy wires holding the bridge up are also weaker. So when you see women having this problem with their, with their push-up or their plank, and often with the push-up, it's not necessarily the arm strength, right? It is, in fact, the core that's taking out. There might be a reason for it. And now I'm not suggesting that we should stop training the core or anything like that. In fact, the opposite. I think we should train it more. But I think we have to under, if we're going to train it effectively, we have to understand that, that yes, in fact, most women are going to be this. So if, you're, if you do a push-up and someone's told you, like, you're this way, you know, you need to fix that, well, you have to start, like, partly, you're, re you're this way for a reason. That's okay. You do have to fix it. And one of the things we'll talk about, it might be that for some women, because it is so hard to get out of this position, the plank might not actually be the best choice. Right, because that is actually quite, you have a long lever, it's actually quite an advanced core exercise, particularly for someone who is a little compromised in strength there. Something like a dead bug variation, I don't know if, does anyone know what that is? Yeah, so if you don't, come and ask me later, but something like that might be a better choice, or a bench plank. The, the, the point being, I think we have this standard sometimes, like everyone should be able to plank for a minute. Um, but you know what, just because everyone should, doesn't mean that everyone can. And I'm going to argue that women probably should get to that point, but probably a lot of them aren't at that point, and they'll do it, they're just not going to do it well, and then they're going to be using stuff that, you know, you don't really want them to do, so you're not actually going to accomplish what you're hoping you're accomplishing. So keep this in mind when you're doing push-ups and, and planks, and I just had an interesting little epiphany on the other side, so what is it about guys that makes the straight leg raise so hard, right? And we've all seen, those of you that, that train people, you probably have seen a lot of clients that don't deadlift well, particularly men, right? They're just really stiff, and you want to get them that hip hinge, but it's just like, Nope, it's just not going there. And you work at it and you work at it and you think, okay, well, guys are just stiff, but then you watch them squat and you're like, okay, no, they're not stiff, so what's going on? And I never really understood it, but I have a little bit of a theory that I'm going to share with you in a second. Um, and it's going to start with, with the skeleton or with the pelvis. And so, list of, show of hands for anyone who had to reread that title to make sure it didn't say sexting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is what, so, the pelvis, uh, from an archaeological standpoint, is actually the best bone for identifying uh, gender. 98% accuracy. The next best one is the skull at 85%. So they call it sexing skeletons to determine what, whether the bones are male or female. And there are a few differences, and this, this photo shows the difference of the, uh, the pubic arch. We're not going to really talk about that part as much today, but what we are going to talk about is the orientation of the acetabulum. So that is the, the two, basically, uh, the hip is a ball and socket joint. So the socket is the acetabulum, and it could sort of face forwards to the side, straight down, or anywhere in between in that area. And what typically, and you can sort of see it in this one, so in the, let's see if I can, this one, for the male one, it's more pointing out and down. So you see here, the woman's, it's gonna like forward, and you can definitely see the difference that it's more, it faces more up than down. Uh, and in fact, if you actually look at the numbers, right, so a difference on average of 5%, or sorry, not 5%, 5 degrees, and a difference of 8 degrees on the, the slope, that's actually quite substantial. Um, 
So what this, and interesting, this information I actually found from automobile insurance research, because typically when men are involved in collisions, they're more likely to fracture their pelvis than women. And what the research, they kind of were like, well, what is going on here? Why is this happening? And then what they came coming up with is that this angle of the acetabulum is probably the reason. Because when a man is in a seated position, it's more likely that the head of the femur is basically hitting the edge of the acetabulum, and the edge is not as strong as the middle. So another thing we notice about this position is it kind of looks like a squat, right? So arguably, the acetabular orientation probably is actually favorable for women in terms of squatting. Now, of course, these are averages, right? So we don't, it's not like all women fall into this and all men fall into this, but the fact that an insurance board wants to look into this suggests that it is actually a pretty significant uh, sort of generalization. Uh, the other element of the hips that are relevant and relevant for squatting is the femoral head. So that would be the ball part. So femur and the head of it. And the way it's oriented, and I find, I, I gotta say, I'll be honest, uh, even though I'm an engineer and stuff, I, I get a little like left, right, uh, confused sometimes. And so these angles, I have to go over them over and over again to remember which one is retroverted, which one is antiverted. But basically, so this one, basically what this, this person here, the retroverted uh, femur means is that, that that bone is kind of sticking in to the socket like this. So it's actually stuck in internal rotation and that femur is only going to be able to basically get external rotation. So that femur there, that person is not going to have much internal rotation because they're already there. Their neutral is internally rotated. More women typically are actually antiverted, so the opposite. So in their normal, they're actually stuck in external rotation. So what we view as normal, normal should be feet forward, uh, normal should be feet forward. But that's not actually true. So, so more women than men, when they're in their normal neutral position um, and their feet are forward, their hip is actually already fully externally rotated. So they can really only go internal. And that means they can go really far internal. Uh, Eric Cressy has written an interesting article about women and squatting and how women, we do tend to have more internal rotation range of motion. We tend to want to use that, right? Like if you've got a motion, if you've got a range of motion that you have, you, you want to use it. So that's where those of you that are coaches, you probably see a lot of women, their knees tend to want to go in when they squat. Or those of you that squat yourself, if your knees go in when you squat and everyone's like, keep your knees out, and you're like, I'm trying, it may be that you're one of these people that have antiverted hips. Um, so because I'm a geek, <laughs> I had to you know un ex experiment with this for myself. So I started looking at hip rotation range of motion in my clients. So as part of my assessment, in addition to doing the functional movement screen, I also, uh, I, I look at my, I get my clients to lie down. I do, an, in, uh, sorry, hips extended and hips flex version. So I have them lie on the ground, I bend their knee, and I move their hip into internal and external rotation. Uh, and then I get them doing it lying on their back, and I do the same thing with their hips, fle hips flex, and I move their leg. Um, and by the way, the reason I do both of those two things, this is like an extra geek level. Uh, there's a guy named Kevin Neald, who's a really great strength coach, does a lot of work with hockey players. He's the one that kind of put that idea in my head that his philosophy or his theory is that when someone is, um, has their hips extended, so when they're like that, this, and you're looking at the rotation, that's the true hip rotation range of motion because it's not as affected by the soft tissue. When you're looking at the, the hip like this, now you've got a bunch of muscles engaged and activated that might affect it. So, and in fact, what I saw kind of confirmed this. For most people, the range that I saw when their hip was extended was a lot greater than when their hip was flexed. So that was sort of confirming that. That's a, sort of a, just a side note. Um, one thing I will point out, uh, I, this was just a visual look. So from a you know, scientific integrity standpoint, Keep that in mind. This is me, you know, putting my hand on their back so that their back doesn't rotate, moving their leg, and looking at it to see. I actually just categorize it as what I considered excessive, good, or limited. And I did actually try to take a goniometer out, which is a little tool you use to measure angles. And just logistically, it was just a bit of a nightmare. So I, I didn't do that. Uh, so there is, again, take, a little, you know, take what I show you with a grain of salt on that, because there could be some 
Some of the people I put in limited might be good. Some of the people I put in good might be excessive. But I think it's still an interesting story. Um, so if you read textbooks about hip rotation, typically they're going to tell you that people have either about 45 degrees of internal hip rotation and about 45 degrees of external hip rotation, or some might say 35 of each. But generally speaking, it's clear, like the textbooks will show a diagram, and here's the range, and it, it looks like this. Um, and the first person who introduced me to the concept that that's not true was Dr. Shirley Sarman at uh, a seminar. And if you ever get a chance to see her, totally should. She's amazing. Um, and, and she showed that I think it was 40% of people did not have normal hips. And she had a great quote about that saying that assuming that uh, a person's hips move to standard is like assuming all women are 5'4 because that's the average. So as someone who's not 5'4 <laughs> uh, and also has wonky hips, I can sort of uh, confirm both. So this was one of my, this is probably the geekiest of the slides on this one. And this is just showing basically uh, where people lie in terms of their total. Like do they actually have equal hip range of motion and is it equal to about 90? And this is where so there are, you know, th this probably would say, if you're familiar with bell curves, and I know Chandra is, uh, I'm not sure who else is, <laughs> that pretty much, yeah, this is probably like, probably about half the people were in that, you know, we do have a, a total of about 90 degrees and relatively equal, uh, the rest don't. So it's a lot of people that don't. Uh, a little more on the findings. So what I found was, and it sort of confirmed what I had read and what people had theorized, is that actually most women, or a large number of women, do have excessive internal hip range of motion. And not very many men do. So 45 or 48 percent depending on the hip, 12 or 8 percent for the, for the guys. Uh, just a weird interesting one, and I have no idea what that means, I just put it on there because in fact it, it actually made me go back and look at my numbers to make sure I'd done the, the calculations right because I was like what is going on there. Um, more than half of men have excessive external hip rotation in their right hip. Now it might be, so most of my clients are athletes, or either are or were athletes, so it is possible that it's a, related to their sports. Um, but honestly, this is one of those, uh, I don't know. So if anyone has any theories, I'd be curious, and I just kind of, because I think like a, as a scientist, or as a, my brother would always say, he's a PhD chemist, I'm an engineer, so he'd call me a scientist editor, not a real scientist. <laughs> so <laughs> whatever, I can accept that. Um, but as anyone involved in science, I think when you, when you see like a, a weird number that doesn't make sense in your data, you have to question, you have to like put it out there because it might actually completely disprove your data, right? So just something to say, when you're like reading some study and there's a part of a study that says, huh, that doesn't make sense, you have to pay attention to that because it might actually mean that the whole thing doesn't make sense. Or it might just be like a, in radar we call them spurious emissions, right? Just like one little number out to the side that makes no sense and that is okay and that does happen. Um, so interesting thing in terms of symmetry, and by the way, the reason I did this test is I had this theory and I was thinking, oh, this is gonna be genius. I'm gonna find out that all these pain issues and stuff like that that people have, or all these movement issues are because they have a difference left to right in their hip rotation range of motion, it's gonna be awesome. Uh, yeah, that turns out to be not true. <laughs> so 57% uh, are actually symmetrical left to right. So really there's like nothing to be learned there except that I was wrong on that. Uh, but that is another cool thing about science, right? Like when people just have a theory that they start with and they're like hell-bent on proving it, be careful of that. Um, but what was interesting is the lack of symmetry between internal and external hip rotation range of motion. So flip that around, 89% are asymmetrical between internal and external hip rotation range of motion. Um, and I'll be honest, I, I don't actually know entirely what that means. I'm, I'm not even really sure. I've, this is sort of like I only just processed this data probably like a month ago, and I've been thinking about it, and, and I debated whether to even present this because I'm not sure, right? Like, it's nice, you want to present, like, I've got this data, it means this. Um, but I think it's kind of fun for me, it's kind of fun to, to sort of welcome you or, like, bring you into the scientific process and say, hey, who has, because I don't really have any ideas, so if someone has ideas, like, if you're thinking about it, I'd love to hear about it. Um, and then the other thing is also just to help share, because we see so much stuff in the New York Times or whatever, and all of you that are trainers, People come to you and say, hey, I read this article in the New York Times about a study that says, and then like introduce some list of things that are only half true. So it's just a reminder to everyone that like, just because it's science doesn't mean it's conclusive, doesn't mean that it's always true, doesn't mean that it's being applied properly. So keep that in mind. Be critical of science. I mean, like love science because science is awesome, but be, you know, have a critical eye about what they're trying to say about science. How did you define symmetrical? So was that 
in your categorizations, or was that? It was in my categorizations, yeah. So, so, so maybe yeah, absolutely. Maybe yeah, you, you know, and, and yeah, so Chandra has a good point. She's a statistician, so obviously she'd have a good point on this one. Because may, maybe it is actually that my categorizations are broad to the extent that, uh, although if that were the case, you'd probably see the same thing in left to right, wouldn't you? We, we should definitely talk offline, for sure. But, but, but it's good. Like, like, to me, part of like any doing anything science if you can't put something out there and be open to criticism of it, then you shouldn't put it out there. Did you, um, how much of that, this asymmetries had to do with dominant versus non-dominant type? Or like just the... Yeah, I don't know. Is this active, passive range of motion? This is passive. Okay. Passive range of motion is a great question. Does this have anything to do with hand dominance or handedness dominance? I don't know. Uh, and it might be that that, it, although, again, I would suggest that that would affect, that would be more likely to affect left to right differences than internal to external. That would be my thought. But yeah, I don't know. And that, you know, maybe when I start doing it in future, I'll actually start making note of, because I don't take that, that's not a piece of information I gather. But, you know, I probably should. Um, so just a little thing I looked at, this was all observation, but uh, because these are clients of mine, I then get to look at them in the gym uh, when they squat and when they deadlift. So I looked at, you know, could I see any patterns evolving with the, you know, can I make sense of this by saying what do I see in the gym that's relevant to this? Now, unfortunately for this, I don't have enough data yet because these are, these are mostly new clients in the last probably six months. Uh, and I don't have all of them squatting or deadlifting yet, partly because I do get a lot of referrals from chiropractors and physios. So some of these people aren't ready to squat based on, you know, stuff that's going on. Um, but of the ones that do, and there's only 17 people, so take it with a grain of salt, uh, what I found, uh, basically, if they had, like, their, their rotation was equal, or if they had a little more internal rotation than external rotation, they tend to be better at deadlifting. And I'll also point out, when I say better, I mean in terms of, like, what it looks like quality, not necessarily how much they can lift. Um, and then equal range of motion in terms of internal to external seemed to point to a better squat. Uh, and then extra external rotation actually turned into a worse squat. Um, so that was just some sort of observations. And, but really, I'm just pointing out, like, t so that you get the idea of starting to think. When your clients are squatting, like, some are really good, some are really bad, some are somewhere in the middle, start asking yourself, are there other reasons other than your sort of current assumptions about their strength and their mobility and that kind of thing? Um, this was an interesting one. And again, not a lot of numbers, but I thought it was kind of... So because I get a lot of referrals from, from manual therapists, uh, I get a lot of people that come in and they check the box saying they have, they either currently have or have in the last probably year or so uh, back pain, uh, knee pain, or hip pain. So I just took all my numbers in my Excel spreadsheet <laughs> and then I added columns that I pulled out those, those numbers or those answers from their, their part key forms. And in terms of left to right, like you'll see down the board like 47%, 67%, 69%. And if you actually look at the, the no pain one, it's 58 So in other words, a lot of people have left-right asymmetries, and there's not, there's not really a lot to be learned from that. But 100% had an internal to external hip rotation asymmetry for back pain. Also those with hip pain, 92% with knee pain. So, and again, I'll say these numbers are small, um, but I think Shannon will agree, like 100% is an interesting number, right? You don't see that very often. So when you see 100%, it kind of is like, hmm. Um, and, and I will say this, please remember, I'm not saying that internal to external rotation range of motion differences cause pain. This is a correlation. It's just these two things exist together. They may be related. I would almost, almost argue they're probably related, but I have no idea if there's a causation. Um, and again, I sort of put it out to anyone who's got opinions on this. I'd love to hear it. But I do wonder, understanding that a lot of people do have these differences, is it possible that the movement that people are doing when they have, the, in the presence of these range of motion differences, is contributing to their problem. And again, I'm not saying it's causing, but is it contributing? So I'm just going to put that out as a question um, and move on. I'm going to talk pretty briefly about the uh, pelvic shape. So this is like sort of the fourth, the third piece of the hip differences. Pelvic shape, basically, there's something called a women's pelvis, and about half of women have them. Uh, and then there's, there's two types of pelvis, pelvises or pelvi that are sort of, you know, wider, and then there's two that are kind of shorter. And effectively, the, like, the pelvis that most men have tends to be really good for bearing weight, uh, 
And then the one that most women have tend to be pretty good for range of motion, can get you into all sorts of positions. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to bring, come back to that in a second, but first I'm going to talk about femoral acetabular impingement, which is interesting to me, probably because I have it, but if you're a trainer, uh, and even if you're someone who works out, this is something that you should actually know about if you don't. Uh, effectively, it's an abnormality in the shape of the femoral head and or the acetabulum, so ball and socket. Uh, odds are, if someone has FAI, it just means they have a little bit of extra bone here, which is likely to crash into the acetabulum, or the acetabulum is longer than normal. Again, that's going to cause some crashing. So there's certain movements that are going to put you into bone-on-bone -bone situations that then do bad things to the cartilage and, and uh, labrum. So when you have clients, or if you're a manual a physical therapist and you don't know about FAI, you definitely should. One study showed 135 out of 155 patients presenting to a clinic with hip-related pain had positive findings for FAI. 87% is a big number, right? So there's a lot of people that have them. Uh, now, interestingly, if you're coaching hockey players, um, and actually soccer players have a high prevalence of it as well, so do skiers, 75% uh, of asymptomatic youth hockey players, so kids that don't have any hip pain, had uh, an alpha angle, which is the angle, basically it's like a, it's, it's an angle of that, where that extra bone is, higher than 55% or 55 degrees, which is the, the sort of diagnostic number for FAI. So 75% asymptomatic hips. So these are kids that don't have any hip pain, which I keep thinking back, uh, does anyone know who Michael Boyle is? Yeah. yeah, so great trainer. And he's kind of done this thing where he doesn't squat his clients anymore. Uh, and interestingly, he works with a lot of hockey players. So I actually wonder if the reason his, his clientele do so well without squats is because a lot of them are hockey players and one would argue that hockey players don't do well with squats, which is actually the last point here. There's actually a study where they looked at, they were actually looking at squatting as a potential diagnostic for FAI to see if they could use that as a, huh. So if you have clients or anyone here, uh, if you get a little pinchy feeling in the front of your hips when you squat, it, I'm not saying that is FAI, but it might be, right? So that's something to pay attention. You shouldn't be getting pinching in here when you squat. Um, that's something to look for. Now, the reason I bring the, the pelvic shape up and the, the FAI up, in addition to you should just know about that, is uh, who's familiar with Wolf's Law? So it's basically Wolf's Law states that your body will develop new bone in response to forces, in, to, in, to, in response to consistent and persistent forces. So when we looked at those pelvic shapes, so the android one, you see that 20% of women have this android pelvis. Most of those women were physically active as adolescents. So their pelvic shape actually changed because of the sports they played. So just a little interesting aside, if you want to generate a really great squatter, find a woman who's got that great range of motion, get her doing sports as a teenager, <laughs> and you'll say, but don't let her play hockey. And as, a, I, and as a Canadian, I say that with, uh, with trepidation, but... Uh, other thing, as women, people that get more obese, their femoral neck actually gets bigger. You know, it's the body's response to like, uh-oh, we, you know, we gotta support this, so it gets bigger. Um, and then back to those hockey players with FAI, this one is really interesting to me. The rate of hockey players with FAI increased as they moved up in age groups. So the 18-year-olds had much higher rates of it than the 12-year-olds, which kind of suggests that maybe FAI is actually, I mean, there are some theories, maybe it's congenital, but I would say it actually suggests that it might be in response to activities. Uh, I'm going to go quickly. This one was, this was sort of my first lab, even though it's number four, it was my first, like, wow, this is awesome. Uh, and it came out of me looking at people deadlifting and wondering why I couldn't get everyone to look the same when they deadlifted. So I started to... And I realized in a few of my clients, I'm like, well, that person has long arms, that person has, seems to have a short torso, whatever. So I actually started to measure it. I measured uh, one through 27 clients. I measured their shin length, their thigh length, their torso length, and their arm length. And then I compared it to, the, like, I made a ratio of it relative to their height and looked at differences. And it turns out there are, in fact, significant differences between individuals. It's not just that some are small and short. There are some tall people with short torsos and short people with long arms and all this. And as it turns out, this affects their deadlift. In fact, so much so that I was wondering, okay, I've got someone that can't deadlift, and I'm thinking, okay, it must be they're, they're not, they don't have the mobility, I've got to stretch them, 
or I've got to get them stronger. And then I thought, okay, well, I'm going to just take these line segments, I'm going to put it into Adobe, and I'm going to draw them in that perfect deadlift position that I want them to be in. And it was when I had this moment, I was like, okay, if I can't draw a perfect deadlift for this person using their line segments where all of their mobility and stability is completely irrelevant, then there's no way they can do it. Right? Like that's just, so that was sort of an aha moment for, this, for me. Um, and just a, a couple of the observations I found is that, so what I realized, once I came to that conclusion, I actually started being a little bit more okay with different um, positions in, in a, in a uh, deadlift. So I, I generally like a higher hip deadlift just because I think if you're doing a lower hip deadlift, you're squatting. And if I want you to squat, I'm going to get you to squat. That's my opinion. That's not necessarily a, um, that's not necessarily a widely held opinion. I'm not a power lifter, so uh, I'll take criticism on that. If, but that's just been my opinion. I now have retracted that opinion only because I know that not everybody can do a high hip deadlift. They're not built for it. Uh, and actually, Jen Sinclair called me out on Facebook, very politely, by the way, which I love that, <laughs> asking me, not even out in public, but like on a message saying, you know, do you ever do sumo deadlifts, right? Because that is, you know, someone has different positions, and I hadn't, actually. Uh, and I really, I really respected and appreciated that she suggested. And I have since then, and I've tried using it with a few clients, and I do think it's a good option in some cases. What I do still find for more people, though, is that I like to... When I've got a deadlift that doesn't look great at the bottom, I will raise the bar. Raise the bar. So I'll use, you know, one inch, two inch, four inch risers, and it's amazing how much prettier a deadlift gets when you take the bar a couple inches off the floor. And to me, like, you know, I'll look at aesthetics of deadlifts. To me, matters a lot. I actually don't really care a lot about aesthetics in the gym, but I do care about the aesthetics of a deadlift because you know at the back is too precious. So if you've got someone doing an ugly deadlift at the bottom. I'm going to say that's a bad idea. Let's try and work on that and figure out a way to get it better. Sometimes rising, raising the bar will make a difference. Um, and in fact, it also, because I'm a geek, I started thinking, well, wait, why are we, what is from the floor anyways? Like, where does that come from? Because when you think about when you squat, you squat from standing. You know, so this is my own body position determines the, the, top, the height at the top, and apparently I do front squats, to, <laughs> to down, right, to how, how far your hips will get you. When you do a bench press, you're basically going from chest to the end of your arms. When you do a deadlift, you're going from 225 millimeters or 8.5, 8.75 inches off the floor to your standing height. Like, so who decided that 8.75 inches was an important number? And so I had to find out, obviously. <laughs> so I did all the reading I could. I looked up, I, I watched some great like virtual tours of a weightlifting history museum. Uh, I called some people, I called Ed Thomas, anyone who's ever talked to Ed Thomas or seen him talk, or if you haven't, you should watch some of his lectures because he's amazing. And he actually uh, put me in touch with Dr. Jam Todd, um, who sent me this great email and it was like, huh, what an interesting idea. So if you've already read this, then you know what it's going to say, but basically she's suggesting that the reason barbell, uh, deadlift bar, the, the bigger plates and the Olympic plates are what they are is so that if someone misses on an Olympic lift, if they do a clean and jerk or a snatch and they miss, when they fall, the bar is not going to crush their head. And as an engineer, I can appreciate that as a design criteria <laughs> <laughs> for Olympic weightlifting. But I'm not sure it has any relevance to deadlifting. <laughs> and so that, again, I would say anyone who thinks that if you're not, if you're not pulling from the floor, you're cheating, I'm going to say, you know what, that's bullshit. You're not cheating. If you're a power lifter, that's a different thing. Competition will tell you what you have to do. But for everyone else, the floor is bullshit. You know, lift it up if you have to, to get a better, uh, to get a better position. So just a quick summary on this. Basically, uh, there's a lot of things, right? So we talked about hips. We talked about core structure. We talked about limb lengths. There's still more, right? Like I was, you know, I've been looking into shoulders a lot lately, and there's a lot there. I didn't, I didn't feel like I was prepared enough yet to talk about it, so I, you know, I'm not talking about that here. Uh, you know, elbows, like there's a lot of stuff. Our bodies are very different. How they're different probably affects the exercise that we use, the exercise that we choose. Um, so that's it, right? So, so now what do we do? We know this. Now what? Do we all just like go to doing like, I don't know, prancer size or <laughs> lifting pink dumbbells and forget about it? No more heavy lifting. Um, and obviously, I would say no. Let's just, let's just get smart about it, right? Let's start to look. Okay, if something... You know, if we have an exercise that we're doing with a client that doesn't look right, well, why doesn't it look right? You know, let's, let's try and fix it. Let's try and understand it. And then we can, we can do better choices both for ourselves and for our clients. Um, 
And, you know, like, I, it's so funny because I keep saying that sometimes I'm like, oh, it's too bad that I'm not an engineer anymore, but it's very clear that <laughs> I am. Uh, and I used to also think that maybe engineering wasn't a good choice for me in school because I never liked what I did in engineering, but I also think it's pretty clear that I am actually very natural at that. So, um, and this is true for me. So, did you want to see it again? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, so how can you tell, right? So someone's exercising, how do you decide that exercise is right for them or not? Like, how many of us have, uh, you know, x-ray equipment in our gym that we have access to that we can interpret, that we can understand, right? None of us. So we basically have to, we can't count on that. Uh, and frankly, sending your clients to an x-ray uh, is kind of a, you know, a dangerous, tricky, they're probably going to find all sorts of stuff that may or may not be relevant and is going to freak them out. So instead, let's look at them exercising. Um, so how do we tell if that exercise is appropriate for them? And to me, the first thing is understand the exercise that you're giving them. Understand what it's supposed to be doing. So a squat, what should a squat look like? Understand that. And if you don't understand it, look it up. There's some, you know, if you're not sure where to look it up, uh, frankly, send me an email. I'll help you. I'll find you some good information on it. Pretty much all of the women presenting here, probably some of the people you're talking to have great insights. You know, talk about it later on this afternoon. What should a squat look like? What should a deadlift look like? What are you actually working on? You know, understand why you're using these exercises. That'll be the first step. And then the second one is you're going to watch the exercise. So this is, uh, I only failed one course in university and it was drafting. <laughs> uh, but it still doesn't stop me from making stick figures. So when you've got someone doing an exercise, watch them. Like what is happening? So first you understand what the movement should look like what the movement is doing, now watch them doing it. And do they look like you think they should look? Um, and I have something. So this is actually, this approach, the way I coach deadlifts, the way I look at exercise, I actually stole from what I learned as a ski instructor. Um, so ski instructors, we have this, it's unfortunate, we, I have to watch someone ski and they're wearing a big baggy ski suit and they're going down like this. So I have like five seconds to see probably three or four turns at which point I have to decide, what am I seeing? What should I see? What's the actual cause of the problem? And then how do I correct it? So you get to have a good eye. And I've kind of drawn that philosophy and taken that philosophy into personal training. So when I look at a deadlift, and so back to the skiing, the other thing we have a thing with skiing is basically look at the feet first. You look at the body from the ground up. So there's a priority, right? There's a, you know, things you look at, joints you look at that are more or less important depending on what, you know, what skill you're assessing. Um, so when I look at a deadlift, for instance, I've taken this same philosophy. And, and this is just my order, by the way. Your order might be different, but I do encourage you to start thinking about when you're looking at a deadlift, start thinking about what is important to you about what you're looking at. Or when you're looking at another exercise. When you look, like, what are you looking for as opposed to just saying, I'm looking at the whole exercise? Because I would argue that most people can't look at the whole thing at once and draw any meaning. But you can look at parts of it and say, check, check, ooh, I'm going to come back to that, check, check, and then you're going to come back to it and you get an understanding of what's going on. So I look at the back first. Uh, if the back is round, I'm going to ask them to let go of the bar uh, or not, not to lift the bar, and we're going to fix that first. Because to me, that's just the, the more critical part of a deadlift is let's keep the back straight. Uh, next thing I look actually is the feet. Uh, and again, other people are going to be different, but I feel that a lot of problems with deadlifts happen because the feet aren't actually well positioned, they're not grounded. And there's a lot of stuff that goes bad in a deadlift that you can actually fix by fixing the feet. Then I actually look at the, the shoulders. Are they actually engaging lats? Um, and then after that, hips for me. And that's where I look at the height of the hips. Can I? I did say before that I don't always make people get their hips higher, but there are some people that can. They just don't. So then I can fix it, uh, and it improves. Uh, I look at the knees. Now, in the case of a deadlift, what I'm looking for in the knees is actually are they coming forwards? You know, some people will do sort of like a, a scoop deadlift. So that's one of the things I look for in the deadlift. And again, I find that often can be actually corrected with the feet. So I might have seen that first, but sometimes it's hard to see it going on in the feet. Um, and then for me, the last thing I look at, second last, is the head neck position. Uh, I am actually a believer in the packed neck concept. I think that's a, a good thing, basically keeping the neck lined up. But I think there's a lot of other things that have to go right before I'm going to address that. And in fact, I look at it like in skiing, we have this, this saying that if you're, if you're taking a ski lesson and your instructor tells you to do something different with your hands, you should give yourself a high five because it means you're doing everything else right. <laughs> My opinion on the, on the deadlift, like pretty much if I'm talking about the neck, it means you're doing a lot of stuff right. 
Uh, so similar concept with squats, but I look at it a little bit differently. Uh, again, back is still number one for me. Um, for me with the squat, actually the second is the hips, and that should make sense given that you know, we talked about all these different parts of the hips and how different they can be. Uh, a big thing you'll see with a lot of people's squats is as they squat down, their hips are going to shift to one side or to the other, or actually maybe both. You might actually get a nice S going. Um, and that's not something that you want in a squat. Just tell you that right now. <laughs> so that's one of the things I look for. Uh, the next thing I look for in, in squats is the knees. Are they caving in? And also, are they coming too far forward? Um, and then I'll start looking at the feet. So, you know, and again, this is just my order, right? You might have a different order, and that's completely fine. Have a reason for your order, but don't assume that just because your order is different, it's wrong. It's probably right. It's just different. Um, so I will look, yeah, how, is the, how are the feet grounded? grounded? And, and then I start looking, you know, shoulders, uh, elbow position, neck position. Uh, bench press, um, not surprisingly, upper body movement, I'm going to start thinking more about shoulders and, and arm position first. But I'm also going to look, are their feet grounded? You know, are there, is their core, this is one usually like you see people as they're lifting, there's a big twist in their body as they're doing it. I'm looking for that. And then uh, the head, I don't know if anyone else sees this, that people bench press like this, yeah, right? Get their head out of there. Um, so again, I just encourage you to start thinking about when you're looking at an exercise, don't look at the whole exercise, start looking at parts of it. What's going on? Because it's going to be a lot easier to, to fix a more, like a smaller problem is easier to fix and identify than a bigger problem. Third part for me to figure out whether an exercise is appropriate, ask, how does it feel? Right? There are often times when an exercise looks great. Someone, you've cued them so well that, yeah, back to the coach I was talking, you've cued them so well that their squat looks perfect, but it hurts like hell. Okay? That's something that you need to know. And then the last thing is put that together, right? What should I see? I know what I, I understand. If I don't understand, if there's an exercise I use and I don't understand why I'm using it, then you shouldn't be using it. Or I should take that back. You shouldn't be using it until you understand why you're using it. And I don't mean you have to have this huge, long, you know, scientific explanation for it, but understand the movements that you're using both for yourself and for your clients. And then understand what you see. And so a lot of you train yourselves. You don't have, you're not trainers. Um, you know, use your phone. Ask your friend to take a video of you taking, doing your exercise. Or do your exercise in front of a mirror and see, like, what's going on? What am I seeing? It's really important. You can see a lot. Because like, we have, let's face it, our, our self-perception is not always spot on in terms of like, oh, I'm awesome. I'm getting down to super deep. You get a video and you're like, oh, hmm. <laughs> OK. So yeah, take a look. And then start thinking, about, OK, why is that what I see? Right? Start to think. And like, just, just think about like, what could it be happening? So for instance, um, Often with, with the hips shifting in a squat, what could actually be happening, A, it could be a painful situation, so that's where asking why is important. It also might actually be a carryover response to a previous pain situation that happened a long time ago that their body still moves around. They don't actually have that pain anymore. Um, I have a, I've trained, anyone who's trained someone who's had ACL tear, odds are they have a shift, a, a, a hip shift in their squat. And it's probably not related to current pain. So you can fix that. And, and why is that happening? OK, it's probably happened because of their ACL tear. Um, and things you can do, uh, mini bands around the knees can help. Or even like putting the, sh the side they shift to, if you put a lift under that foot for a while, it's going to prevent them from putting all the weight on that side. Uh, all sorts of things you can do. But start thinking, OK, if, you know, how should it look? Like, what should be happening? Um, what am I actually seeing? And why is that what I'm seeing? And that will help you to suddenly when you kind of break it down, suddenly it's easy, to, it's easy to solve. So then the next step, can we fix it? Um, or can we fix it appropriately? <laughs> um, and that's the big question. Is it something I can coach? Right? Like, so I'm talking about all these things that are going on in our structures that may impact exercise. It doesn't mean that it will impact exercise. It might. You need to be aware of it. But that doesn't mean that you can't coach stuff. Like, I think you can coach a lot of people deep in the hole with their squat. Um, some of the problems might be weakness. Like, let's face it, we get a lot of clients that come in, they're not very strong. And that's OK. You can help with that. right? We have people that don't move well. That's OK, too. We can help with that. Um, sometimes people misunderstand the instruction. Uh, and I have this thing, I have this, my personal saying, I've got, on, I've got an article called The Ten Commandments of Coaching, where I talk about this. Like, if all of your clients are doing a movement wrong, it's you, not them. <laughs> 
coach it differently. And then understand that not everyone hears things the same way, not everyone interprets things the same way. So if you only have one coaching cue that you use for every exercise, you don't have enough. You know, find more. And you know, by the way, your, your, your clients will tell you really good ones. I learned from my clients. I learned one last week. I was trying to coach uh, single leg Romanian deadlifts. I was trying to get the shoulders back, trying to keep them that way, because as they got down here, suddenly they drop like this. You know? And I think it's actually because they're trying to reach the floor. So I'm saying, OK, keep your shoulders back. I want you to stay horizontal. And this client of mine, she's, you know, I can see her like gears are turning, gears are turning. And then suddenly, she starts doing it really well. And I'm like, that was great. What happened there? And she said, I started thinking about aligning my back with the ceiling. I was like, huh, yeah, I never thought of that before. So uh, Nina, a client of mine, she's responsible for that new one to be added to my toolbox. So if you see another coach using a great coaching cue, if, um, if a client shares what they're thinking, put it in your toolbox. You know, use it, credit. I'm a fan of you know, crediting where credit is due, but use it. Don't be afraid to. Um, some people are uncoordinated. And I don't say that with any judgment whatsoever. But not everyone has the same level of coordination. Some people are not going to be able to do certain exercises because they do not possess the coordination to do it. And that's OK. And it's not fair for you to get frustrated with them because they can't do it. But it means you've got to learn how to adjust the exercise so that they can do it. Right? That's still coachable. It's just maybe not coachable with that exercise. Uh, injury, kind of touched on that. But there are a lot of injuries that are going to make certain exercises painful or just not possible. So respect that. Those I would still put in the coachable category because it's probably a, um, you probably can't do it now, but you can do it later. So I wouldn't put that in the, we're not doing that category. I'd put that in the, let's understand this injury. Let's see how the injury evolves. Hopefully, if someone's got an injury, you're not treating it. If you're a, a trainer, you're you know, working with a manual therapist who is treating it or a healthcare professional. Um, but as that gets better, this exercise becomes coachable. Self-perception is a kind of a cool one for this. And I actually had an experience with this recently. A client, no matter what I tried, I couldn't get her to squat pretty much below. Like her squat basically looked like, like this. Like this was pretty much all she would do. She would not go any lower. And I had, like I was, okay, use the TRX to unweight, all sorts of stuff. And then what I find was I actually had her squatting down to a heavy kettlebell that she wouldn't pick, just pick up, that just was there in front of a wall. So there's something like her back up against a wall. So almost like going down this, I had to go down. She does this, and I'm like, hey, pull yourself down, pull yourself down, pull yourself down. Right? And suddenly she can get down to this position. And she was just like, that feels weird. Right? I'm like, was well, it hurt? She's like, no, no, it's just weird. People have this idea that they can't do stuff. Right? Or, and they've just never been there. Their body doesn't recognize that place. That is going to prevent someone from doing an exercise sometimes. That is coachable. It requires patience. And it might require creativity. But as long as you've understood the exercise, you understand the body, you've asked how it felt, there's no pain that's preventing them. You know, maybe their perception is something that's keeping them from doing something. And if it's none of those things, I invite you to consider the possibility that it is actually a structural limitation and that maybe that's not a great exercise for them. So I'm just going to quickly go over. Um, do I have a couple minutes? Okay. Um, these, I basically do, this is pretty much my whole coaching. This is like, this is all I do. All my clients, all my, my exercises get fixed or get improved or get more awesomer, uh, which is a word I like to, cue, to create. Uh, add a new coaching cue. As I said, if they're not getting it, it might be you. Change the way you say it. Or show it. Understand, by the way, uh, visual feedback is really important for some people. I know there are some trainers who think that you shouldn't have mirrors in a gym because people should feel the exercise. They should, sure, but not everyone will. And not everyone is a kinesthetic learner. Some people learn audibly. Some people learn visually. Some people learn by feel. So if you give them the opportunity to see it, hear it, and feel it, you've pretty much got a 100% chance that you're actually going to get to that person. So recognize that. Mirrors are great. As I mentioned, uh, video is great. Sometimes you'll tell people, like, OK, change this. They think they're already doing that. That's why they're not changing it. Take a video of it and say, see, this is what you're doing. They're like, oh, OK, I thought I was going a lot deeper. And then the next time they do it, they're probably going to go deeper. Um, if they can't, sometimes just reduce the range of motion. right? And I'm not saying you're going to reduce it for all time, although I do think for deadlifts there's an argument too. But reduce it a bit. Let them get strong and powerful in that range of motion. 
and then increase it. And then increase it again and then increase it until you're at full range. Or if you get to full range and it's not great but you're halfway between, then that's probably a good place to hang out. Right? So understand that you can reduce the range of motion, uh, reduce the load. Right? Sometimes, sometimes a movement looks great with one load and then as you add load it doesn't look great anymore. That can affect it. The reverse can be true. So something like a split squat. If someone can't really do it, if you give them a TRX to hold on to, and you just say, you know what, use it as much or as little as you need to, now that person can do a split squat. And the first few times, it's actually amazing how empowering that is for someone who can't do this stuff when they're like, oh, I could do it. And then it usually actually only takes a couple weeks before they can do it without the TRX, which that is an amazing feeling for them. And then it's an amazing feeling for you when you get to help them do that. Um, RNT, I should have written that out, reactive neuromuscular training kind of a cool phase, but basically, so if you ever seen someone use a mini band around the knees for fixing a squat, the concept being, uh, if someone's, for instance, in a squat, if someone's knees are, are going in, if you push their knees further in, the brain will say, whoa, I don't like that. It will react by pushing out. So it, is to, it actually tends to be a much more effective technique. Some, some people, if they see the knees going in, they'll put a ball between the knees, which actually can have the opposite effect of what you want, because it will actually encourage them to squeeze the ball, right? And that's going to actually encourage the opposite of what you want. So put the band on it, get them out. There's all sorts of other options. Uh, I've had people with this shift uh, post ACL tear. I actually will put like a band around their waist. So if they're shifting to uh, this side, I will pull them this way and their body will react by going back to the middle. Um, break it down, right? If, if, something like, if something just doesn't look great, break down the movement pattern. You know, look at a smaller part. If a deadlift doesn't look great, teach them to hip hinge. You might actually find that just their deadlift looks terrible, and then it turns out that this is how they hip hinge. Okay? Well, now you, know, now you know the problem. Fix that, and then bring it back into the deadlift. Break it down for strength, right? So someone has a weakness in their deadlift. Um, you know, maybe some, some hip thrusts would be a good thing to do for a while. You know, get them really strong in that hip extension, then take them back to the deadlift. Uh, or range of motion as well, right? Sometimes you see split squats and that, that back hip just doesn't sort of straighten, it comes down like this, you know, stretching, stretching uh, myofascial release or foam rolling, that kind of thing can be helpful. Uh, counterbalance, that example I met, gave of like the kettlebell, uh, another one, someone's goblet squat or, or sorry, if someone's squatting and they tend to flop forward as they squat, you give them a kettlebell, not a particularly heavy one, but you know, 10, 20 pounds, get them to push it out as they squat, you'll actually see a remarkable improvement in their squat. You might, I should say, you won't necessarily, but you will in a lot of cases. And then the other one I do is like make it impossible to cheat. So with the example of a split squat, if someone's knee is always going forward in their split squat and you try and coach it out and you can't, put a bench in front of their knee. Now their knee can't squat and they can't go forward. And the, the cool thing there is you'll actually sometimes see, you can actually see the gear, like they, they start to go down and they're like, I always, I, and they're, they're, it's like you could almost see this like, ah, I don't know what to do, but then they do it, and then it's like, okay, now I got it, right? Uh, a little thing to remember with all these, like, just because you fix it the one time doesn't mean it's going to stick forever. You probably actually have to do it a few times, uh, sometimes a lot of times, so just remember that. It's not like, okay, we fixed it today, now you're perfect forever. Eh, it probably needs a few, a few sessions. And then my last, uh, number 11, has anyone seen Spinal Tap? <laughs> That's why they're 11. <laughs> Maybe there's a better exercise for that person. And I'm just going to throw it out there. Not everyone has to squat. Not everyone has to deadlift. Not everyone has to bench press. Not everyone has to shoulder press. There's no exercise that everyone has to do. Because for every exercise, there's a whole lot of other options. And that's it. <laughs>